Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. My name's Phil. Joining me as usual, I've got Rohan with me. Hey, Rohan. Hey, Phil. And we've got a special episode today. We're doing a spotlight episode. So joining us from Florida in the US is Keith. Hey, Keith. Good morning. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily and securely access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that also supports the Home Assistant project. The configuration is done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. So, Keith, you sent us an email a couple of months ago uh, describing, you know, your unique use cases for home automation and home assistant. And we thought, you know, rather than just tacking you onto one of our usual episodes, we thought it was a pretty unique use case for home assistant. So, why don't you introduce yourself and, and tell us how you're using uh, home assistant? Okay, yeah. Um, I have a unique perspective in that I am blind. I use home automation for uh, navigational and informational purposes as well as, as, you know, just security kind of thing as far as lighting goes mm-hmm. and that type stuff. So right. um, being blind, it's it's been a bit of a challenge, but it's also my career. So, um, well, my career is programming and um, early in my career, it was uh, uh, printed circuit board design. So. Nice. I, I do have a love for electronics and, and programming, so that's kind of where I, I started. Okay. What, what's really led you to uh, wanting to use a home automation? Obviously, there's there's a ton of benefits here, but for for you, from your specific use case, what does that what does that look like? Okay. So, well, um, <laughs> let me let me back up a second. I sure. I have. I have a, uh, a retinal degenerative disorder, so I've not been blind my whole life. I've I've come. Um, it's called retinitis pigmentosa. Um, if any of your listeners are familiar with macular degeneration, which is like an age-related blindness, mm-hmm. um, I have. It's, it's related. It's in the same family. It's just opposite. I've lost my peripheral vision. Um, down through a cone kind of thing and, and then eventually out of the central. So, um, but what's unique to my situation is that I've retained a bit of uh, what I call them islands of vision in my periphery. So I can, I have light perception to an extent and also can, can pick up um, dark light in a very well lit situation can pick up dark light uh, transitions. Right. So people moving around you in the daytime, I can kind of catch out of the corner of my kind of thing. But, um, so that's the background, but, um, early when my, uh, I moved back to the United States from my dad was, uh, uh, a range rat is what we call him. He worked for the downrange, uh, tracking facilities, uh, during the space program Oh wow! Uh, in, oh, the, cool. in the early sixties and through the sixties. And uh, so I grew up, I grew up bouncing across the Atlantic, um, between Florida and South Africa. And we, we, when we finally moved back to the United States, um, in 75 time frame, four or five, we moved to a community that had just been recently built down there called Coral Springs in South Florida, uh, the Miami Fort Lauderdale area. Coral Springs was, uh, had a tagline called the community of the future. So, um, in this community, they had a, a house that they had set up that was, um, the, the home of the future. And it had all kind of neat thing. It had this automated garage door opener. It had, uh, automated, some automated lighting, um, uh, mm-hmm. motion detecting kind of things. Um, uh, photo sensors on the exterior of the house that would turn the lights on at, uh, at dusk, that kind of thing. So um, being in the same neighborhood as that house, it kind of piqued a curiosity at that time for a 12-year-old. Sure. Um, was this related to Westinghouse or something? I, I remember it seeing was, a random yes. YouTube video. Maybe it was like from CNET or The Verge or something, and, and they basically showed you know this vintage... Westinghouse or some, you know, famous or maybe General Electric or something. And they were showing this house, you know, back in, you know, that, that time frame. And it was the same thing, right? You know, food that could just come out of a, a hole in the wall that was 
cooked and heated, you know, things that we take for granted now, you know, video calls and all that. But it was very fascinating just yeah. how close to reality it actually came. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's cool. I, I've never seen this before. Yeah, and, uh, if I find the YouTube video again, I'll, I'll post it in the show notes. Yeah, cool. that's interesting. Cool, yeah. Yeah, so that, that you know, for a 12-year-old, I was like, wow, science yeah. fiction, man. This is great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but uh, um, as far as automation goes, fast forward to 92 when uh, my wife and I bought our first home, we bought it on a street that was one of these um, – streets that at Christmas time, uh, Chevy Chase moved in. Um, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, this whole, the street, we, we didn't know at the time we bought the house, but, but like the guy, the neighbor at the end of the street was Chevy Chase. And, and then the whole street had to compete. So we had, we, it was a dead end street and our driveway was the turnaround. And we had just lines of cars going in and turning around, going in and just all night long. So we, uh, um, I, of course, you know, I had a few lights up the first Christmas, but then, you know, I was told that, the you know, you're going to, you're going to need to participate basically. <laughs> um, yeah. oh, okay. So you're letting so, the street down. Keith, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the next year I, I went all out with lights and, and I mean, really did it up Chevy Chase style. I mean, literally to the point of, you know, taking each bulb and making it face the same direction with, with, um, um, staples on the side of my house and that kind of oh, thing wow. and running, running, uh, one by, uh, twos, cutting one by twos and making little candle lights down the driveway stuff, you know, all these, just, just a phenomenal amount of lights. But yeah. anyway, having all these lights, um, I had to turn them all off at night, which meant I had to go around to four five, six sockets and, and either flip a switch or, or, uh, unplug, or, unplug whatever. or whatever. Right. Right. So back then it was, um, radio, radio shack had a, a product called powerhouse. That was it. Uh, mm. which was an X 10, their, their version of X 10. So I started then, you know, after that out of self-defense started looking for switches and stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, um, so started down that path and got a few uh, few of their in wall sockets as well as their little modules, and and did the the automation thing the following year, and it just built on from there. Um, it, it was X ten for the the seventeen years we lived in the house, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, but when I moved, we moved back in two thousand eight. We moved here. To this house that I had a problem with X10 in that the phase was out on half the house. And I don't know if you all are familiar with the, the phase issues with X10 or not, but... Uh, yeah, well, I think basically it, it, before Z-Wave and Zigbee sort of, you know, this is old school home automation. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 yeah. The, you know, right, this is the old school. This is my first foray into home automation. So I, I love, you know, when anyone ever says X10, I'm like, yeah, I remember X10. Yeah. Day. <laughs> and it was basically, you know, it would communicate through your power lines, yeah. you know, um, with your AC current in between. I, I'm not a technical person. I could be completely wrong, but it would communicate through your power lines, send the communication packet across your power lines. And if your house was on a different circuit or had multiple circuits or in your case, phases, uh, yeah, it, it could it potentially work. not communicate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What it does is it transmits the uh, the signal down the carrier side of the 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 amplitude, the sine wave, mm-hmm. and of the AC signal. And when I say out of phase, if if half your house is catching stuff on the lower phase and you're sending stuff on the upper phase, your your lights are never going to, or your switch is never going to switch or whatever, yep. you know, whatever yep. component, yep. that kind of thing. They, they, they have uh, a module that you can actually connect. I think it's to your dryer, um, which is 240, which hits both sides. With both phases. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you can solve that. But, but wow, that's interesting. The the thing was was at the time I was like yeah this X10 is like really old it's getting long in yeah. the tooth right so I started looking into Belkin had just come out with their Wemo product line yeah we'll we'll get back to that in a second um, <laughs> <laughs> so but uh, um, 
so I started looking at, at, at well, bought a few of their, their Wi-Fi modules at the time. And those were great. Those were awesome. I, I, I really started uh, falling in love with those. So what, um, what happened was um, you had to control it all through the app. There was no real automation behind it. And their, their scheduling uh, system was for crap, especially for me, in that their app was not very accessible at the time. Mm. So, you know, hey, hey, Megan, my daughter, you know, can, can you look at this and set some times and help me out here? You know, I, right. I, you don't want that. This is my hobby, not hers. Right. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, and this is I'm assumably this is when uh, um, your your eyes had basically started deteriorating. So, or, yeah, I, I got a guide dog in 2000, um, okay. bought this house in 2010. At the time, I had still. um had some usable vision. Okay. Um, so I didn't really, um, no, no facial recognition or anything like that, but I could still make things more, out more, work. more so than, than you can now. Oh yes. Oh, most yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Fast forward 10 years and, and I've just got light perception. So, okay. um, but, uh, the, the, the thing was, was that in, in, I started looking for, you know, being a, my background in programming and, and uh, uh, printed circuit board design, um, I wanted to be able to control my system. Well, uh, I at the same time, I was switching over to the Mac because Tiger had come out and voiceover had, was becoming very usable. Okay. Where where before my only option was JAWS on a JAWS, which is an acronym for Job Access with Speech, by a company Freedom Scientific over here in St. Pete. Um, mm. It's a third party add on to Windows that gives access and makes a, a computer talk. They have a, a it's a intercept a video intercept that okay. catches all the 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 video going to your monitor and translates it or OCRs it on the fly and, and feeds it back to you as speech. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, from, from very early days in Apple, well, it's a third party, you know, Microsoft didn't build it in natively. Whereas, mm. um, Apple went the other route. They started ground up with accessibility from the early yeah. days of the Mac and baked it in, into the operating system. So it was, it, you know, it has its issues. Definitely, I'm not going to say it's a perfect solution, but um, it's it's much easier for us to to use that solution. Now, I'm, I'm probably starting a, a flame war here between the the <laughs> Windows and Mac people, but <laughs> you know. So, but yeah. yeah so, so anyway, um, I, I you know being getting into the voiceover at the time and. and um, coming from a Unix background in my career, I was looking and Unix and Linux. Um, I was looking for ways to automate these switches that I had bought from Belkin, and and not have to to go into the app and turn them. You know, it's it's fine that I don't have to walk around the house and turn them off every night, but doing it from my phone was still a pain in the butt, right? Yeah. So um, uh, the Mac has this. Um, application on it called keyboard maestro and uh it's, it was actually developed by a fellow down your way phil i believe in new zealand you're from new zealand correct australia close australia to, yes. canada so, u.s same thing yeah, right? same thing same thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um down down that part of the world he he uh um he made this thing it's a keyboard intercept application as well as you know that over the years he's added a lot of functionality to it and one of the things he added was the, the ability to um, create or add Python script. Okay. Well, I had been doing, um, I had started and f found some RESTful APIs to, to manipulate the Belkin switches, a little project on GitHub somewhere that, that I had coded into a bash application or, you know, a bash script. So it, that's kind of the, the trend. Uh, transition, I, a bash script to keyboard maestro, keyboard maestro to one day I found a uh, home assistant and man, it's Python. Python is, is my language of choice. So I was all about that. Got a little kind of uh, turned off by the ability of YAML 
to do some more complicated things. Mm -hmm. So when I apologize, but I forget his name, um, the gentleman who through developed uh, app demon Mm -hmm. came out with it, man, my life was, was just awesome at that point because I had everything I needed. I could write my own um, automations, do everything I needed to do from the command line because that's where I live was in the command line. And uh, um, so, yeah, I was a happy camper at that point. That's awesome. I think, uh, yeah, Andrew. Andrew, that's had him. him on, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the very, one of the very first episodes. Like episode two or something. Or yeah. Three or... Yep. Yep. And, uh, oh man, I, I, I worship the ground that he walks on. <laughs> that, for me, that was like, oh man, because, okay, well, when I get into some of my, my automations, I'll, I'll explain. But um, yeah, it, just the ability to, to add more complex things to the system was, was what I was looking for. Because at the time, I mean, I'm sure um, that uh, Home Assistant now has much more capability innately but you know, I'm I'm still a command line guy, so I want to stay. That's where I kind of want to stay and live. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you know, you must be looking at a a lot of the moves towards you know the focus on the UI, of moving things away from YAML and code, and sort yeah. of you know where, where it, yeah. I also find it fascinating that you moved straight from X10 to to Wemo. You sort of missed the whole. Um, X10, I think there was a, a PC module for X10 that you could, and there was software that you could run your house through um, X10. There was. I didn't I didn't quite miss that. Um, I had, um, of course, being a Linux guy, I, I did have the powerhouse um, uh, serial input device that, yeah. mm-hmm. that you could, with the six switches on it and, or six uh, toggles on it that you could set up and hook up to the different things. And, and I did, I, I was starting to get into that at the time, um, did some rudimentary automation with, with that device. But the, again, the problem was that the GUI applications for those devices were not accessible, uh, especially right. under Windows. Right, so, yeah. so I'm hacking C code. And, and hacking the device in order to, to set up my own little automations, turn this off at that time, that kind of thing. So my Linux box became my controller for the controller. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it was, it was a crazy time. It was, it was fun. You know, I, I yeah. you know, learned a lot, but uh, um, yeah. So. so, so, so it's interesting. So is it, easier for you accessibility wise to use cli overall or is that that just more of a comfort thing or is that is that is it actually just easier um from accessibility like i'm sure it's just straight up text right so you don't so whatever accessibility tool doesn't have a bunch of stuff to parse through but it's yes it's not that it's easier it's easier to get to the information that you need to get to in a timely fashion. Okay. Like, like for instance, when I was hooking up here with having to go through the GUI and figure out where I was and what I was doing <laughs> is, is a very um, serial type of mm. uh, imp- or, or feedback. You know, I have to, I have to go through every element on the screen one by one by one by one yeah. to figure out what's going on. Okay. Oh, there's the join button. Okay, fine. I found it. You know, it's not can you look at a screen and oh there's the join button this is what you need to do that kind of thing yeah well on the cli having been in it for so long i can i can just grab the information that i need from uh wherever i'm looking for it i mean you grep is my my yep. friend you know <laughs> awk said i i you know i'm a i'm a vi guy so um, jumping around and setting markers and my, that's my editor of choice. Um, I can, I can manipulate and move very quickly within, within a file, sometimes much faster than a sighted person. Okay. You know, um, that was, as one of the things in my, uh, work life where, where people were just like amazed at how fast and they still are that how fast I can move around a screen or a familiar environment mm-hmm. on a screen that, then they can I can I can speed past them you know boom 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 it's, it goes almost as fast as the computer goes yeah. but but 
when it comes to something that I don't know and finding that information, there is the time uh, hit. So, yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah, no, I, 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 my CLI is, is where I live. So that's, that's kind of, you know, um, I started playing with, there was another guy from Europe somewhere that did a, a, a HA CLI mm-hmm. that, that I have been very, I heard, uh, I think it was on your podcast that he either that or in the community where I read something about it. And I actually got to the point where I downloaded it and then my daughter bought a house and I haven't been able to do any computing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm very interested in that. If I can, if I can, if that's still, you know, um, uh, being um, updated and, and managed and uh, a viable alternative, then yeah, heck yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that was like Fabian, uh, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that started that and, mm-hmm started working through that. And, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's interesting, right? Cause there's, there's all of these different methods now to kind of access home assistant, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a CLI, whether it's a Python scripting, uh, directly into home assistant or using a tool like app daemon, um, there's node red, uh, of course, node red, exactly. Right. So, which is, which is really cool. Right. And, and I think, I think, Again, taking an accessibility lens on this, and 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 Keith, I'll defer to you and your opinion because obviously you're more reputable in this topic than I am. Um, it, it's it's. What are your thoughts? I mean, I mean, do you do you agree? Do you disagree that all of these things kind of lend towards kind of helping that? Or oh yeah, that, like you know, what is the old saying? There's more than one way to skin a cat, and that's good. Yeah, you know, it it it's it, you shouldn't have to. Um, stick to one method for accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. And well, what's <laughs> what what prompted my um, reaching out to you guys was when Phil lost power yeah. and had to do a fresh install. And when he said that he had to set his time zone with a GUI that was connected to Google, yeah. I went, I went, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so. I had no internet, and I, I spun up a fresh copy, and I, I actually checked it the other day. I, I can't, I, I couldn't see an input box uh, to change that latitude and longitude without scrolling on a map. You, you can set it in YAML, which is fine, but yeah, I think it, it certainly highlights, especially without like what that was just the internet, right? But of course, if you can't physically see on, mm-hmm. on the screen. That, that's another conundrum too. Yeah, right? exactly. So from an accessibility perspective. So, I mean, I mean, on that, Keith, uh, how, like, like where, where do you see, where do you see improvements on, on something like this? So uh, with, of course, the, the iOS app, um, oh goodness, what's the gentleman's name? I'm so tired. I'm sorry. I'm terrible Robbie? with names. Bobby, Robbie, Robbie, yeah. Robbie, Robbie, yeah. Robbie, yeah. He, I, I reached out to him at some point, and he has made it better. Um, although I will put out there that he could add some love to the, the iOS app. For instance, you know, um, Rohan, you're, you're an iOS user, so yep. the Home Assistant on iOS app, the at the, I'm going to say it's the upper left corner. I'm going to say it might be the hamburger thing, yep. the, the where you pops out and you can choose from hacks or uh, setting up that kind of thing. Yes. I have no access to that. Well, that's not, that's a lie. I, I do have access to it, but it's not hooked up to the gesture set that, that is the voiceover gesture set. In other words, when with iOS, a voiceover user will flick to an element yeah. and, where you would touch it, I flick to it, you know, swipe to it and, and find it. Listen. So this is a button. Okay, good. I'm on that button. Now to actuate that button, I do a double tap. And at that point it gets actuated. Well, same, same thing with that hamburger button or area. It should, a double tap should hit it. Well, it doesn't. It, I have to do some 
I don't even know what I have to do. I can just sometimes do <laughs> it. It's, it just, yeah, it's like double tap and hold and then hit with your other finger. Or, yeah, I mean, just to you know, hold the antenna this way and put your leg that way. You know, one of those <laughs> numbers, you know, it's a dance right. to get to it. It's not, it's, it's, it's just not, um, the correct, uh, method for, for accessing that stuff for us. Um, but other than a few little things like that, he's done a hell of a job. It's, 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 really accessible i mean i i set up some lovelace cards for myself that that are basically just my little things with lights um my switches a uh, what i call my my um alarm system which is mm -hmm. is basically a a informational card on the state of some various things that i'm interested in and then uh, i have a fourth card that's my my uh, air conditioner my um, climate control stuff and um, and that's basically my my working in in the iOS side of it now, on the the web access portion of it, it is I'm gonna say I'm gonna give it a, a, a nine out of ten for accessibility. Okay. Um, it it is it, and again I I have requested in the past. Hey guys, keep this in mind, you know, <laughs> when you're developing it. But but there's there's a few places where it could where it needs some love. Um one of the things that, that comes to mind really quickly is the um when you're setting up a uh, a device or or when you're managing a device. If I want to delete it, I've found a a spot that it, I I can't even tell you what the the what it says, but it's, it's not a button and it's not, it's in a group, which is a, a thing in, in voiceover on, on, uh, um, the Mac. But I just happened to one day and the pop-up came up and said, are you sure you want to delete this device? I'm like, yes, I found, it. okay, good. I can do this by myself, <laughs> you know, because uh, yeah. prior to that, I was, I was having Megan help me, you know, getting sighted assistance to, to, yeah. to delete something which is a pain in the butt. Um, the WC3, W3C, W3C, and, and there's, yep. there's, another, there's another web consortium, um, uh, WCAG, WCAG, um, have these guidelines that if, it, you know, for, for doing um, accessibility on web pages and stuff like that. And mm. generally, if, if whoever's developing the web page follows those with alt tags, image, uh, alt in, uh, tags for images and um, make sure that buttons are labeled and it's not a one of the I say one of the best things and one of the worst things for a blind guy was the invention of JavaScript um, right uh, it's gotta be right yeah because what's happened what's happened is these you know you you get you land on a, a, a menu item say and this cute little for you flyout comes up and mm -hmm. you've got another list of stuff that you can choose from that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, until, until that get, becomes baked into, to Safari, Google and, and the other, um, um, well, oh, shoot, I was thinking Firefox, Firefox. And I was thinking of the Microsoft one. What's the new one? Oh, uh, Edge. Edge, Edge that's it. Now. Um, they, uh, um, it, it's not totally inaccessible. It breaks accessibility for us. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's a constant fluid thing with, with, you know, as, as the web develops and, oh, Hey, we've got this new toy, then, then the manufacturers have to bake that into, to the accessibility portion of their toy, you know, or their, their screen or, uh, uh browser. So, you know. So you said before that you would give home assistant a, a nine out of 10 for its accessibility and considering that. Home Assistant is, you know, primarily a web-based application because you know you access the admin panel from a from your browser. Mm -hmm. How does Lovelace handle, you know, your, all your Lovelace cards, or even maybe some custom cards that you may have implemented? How how is that handled in terms of accessibility? Um, I've actually been a little afraid to move away from my my. What is it? UI Lovelace.yaml file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because you know I, I, it's I don't know I, I'm I'm scared. <laughs> I, I, sure. I want I want to play with it. I do and and will after again I get my daughter 
situated with her house and everything. And I had some time, but, um, it, it, it's, I'm hope it, so far it's all been pretty accessible. I have not gone into any of the new, new lovely stuff. Other than, you know, I've been, I, I created my card when um, Lovelace came out of beta and, right. and, and have not done anything with it since then, really, other than, other than change my YAML to, to update it, which is great because um, I can make a change in my editor and I get a prompt on, on my phone to, do you want to, you know, this file's been changed. Do you want to update it? Um, yeah. You know, so, so it's instantaneous. It's great from that perspective, mm-hmm. you know. I just, I, I'm a back end user and yeah. I'm, I'm, I will use the front end, but I would prefer to stay away from the front end as much as possible. And, and, um, if they take that away from us, ouch, <laughs> just yeah, ouch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Which it's I guess is what, one of the, a good point, you know, they, they've come out and said, you know, YAML's not going away. Um, and the API is definitely not going away. So mm-hmm. things like App Daemon, Node Red, they're still going to to work. So I guess that's it's good that they've actually given us some clarity around that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I missed the State of the Union, um, but from listening to your podcast, I I kind of got that idea, which was was you know after the after we had started our conversation and our initial. Uh, meet up but um i'm really really glad and you know paulus is um a phenomenal programmer and i mean his i've been put it this way i've been a home assistant user since probably point one two one three something like that i mean early days oh, wow. nice. early yeah. days mm-hmm. um when because at the time i i was searching for um a, a way because <laughs> I don't know if you either you use Keyboard Maestro or not, but um, it's similar to shortcuts in that it's a okay. building block situation. You have these actions that you you put put together ifs and and um, uh, it's just similar to, to home assist or uh, shortcuts, but they can get you know, nested if statements get very hairy and 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 again it's in a GUI. It's it's a pain in the butt. And, mm-hmm. and I just was looking for a, a, a CLI based solution to the, to my problem, um, ran across and Python. I, I, all my scripts were in Python previously. And, um, so when, when I found Polis's, uh, project, I was just all about it. It was, it was like. Mm. Mecca, <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, I don't know. Um, I, one of the one of the technologies that I landed on was the Z Wave. I'm 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 Zigbee. Sorry, Phil sucks. Um, <laughs> no, I, I've I've always been a. I have both. I, I've always preferred Z Wave because it doesn't conflict with Wi Fi. It's yep more of a standard protocol, you know, I can buy multiple brands and, and know that's going to work with each other yeah. as opposed to Zigbee where it's a sort of a crapshoot. Is my Philips Hue hub going to be able to talk to this Xiaomi stuff or, yeah. or whatever? Well, it, it comes back to, you know, what was their interpretation of it, right? Yeah. Whereas exactly, uh, yeah. Z-Wave, I think, is a lot stricter because, again, it mm-hmm. is a proprietary and it, it's a pretty closed source yep. um, yeah. product, right? Where, you know, as as much as I'm not, for closed source, there's still a bit of control that comes with it, right? So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, make sure it works, kind of thing. That, yeah, well, that's one of the reasons. I mean, Apple's wall garden. That's you know, uh, um, yeah. Z uh, yeah. Wave's proprietary system. But um, yeah, like you said, Phil, I, I had well. So after the Belkin switches, I started getting into the their lighting. There, I got a Belkin. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a Zigbee or yeah, it was a Zigbee little, little box. And, um, and then I finally bit the bullet and got when the, the Philips Hue 2.0 came out with home, uh, home kit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I got that. It came with two, two lights. Well, their lights are 50 bucks a piece. So yeah. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, Cree came, Cree came out with their light bulbs 
that were yeah. were supposed to initially didn't you know Hugh broke it, but um, they finally settled and came back and allowed them on their system. But the again the reliability was just not there. Yeah. Um, if the reliability is not there, guess what's not there? The wife is a, a acceptance factor. You know, yeah. if the lights don't work, then I hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, especially with our front porch, because um, my wife likes our, our front porch light to be in the, our outside front porch light to be on at, at night. So if yeah. it's not on, then I hear it and yeah. I don't yeah. like to hear it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, so hence my, my moving away from Hugh, I have one Hugh bulb in here and it's going with my daughter. Um, as soon as she gets moved into her house. But um, it, it's, I settle on LifeX, the Wi-Fi LifeX bulb says my, yeah. my lighting solution. Um, I can get those uh, for like $24 on sale I, yeah. at, at uh, Black Friday. I buy two or three yeah, of them but Surely year. they're not much cheaper than, like their general normal price is pretty on par with Philips Hue though. The- their general price is yes. And and I'm sure that you can buy Hue, but that uh, at, at a reduced price. But well, I don't. Uh, maybe I, I I don't really see them going on sale too much. Like I'll see like bundles with them in. Like I think I saw, yeah. I saw a deal this week where they're like, "Hey, get an Amazon Echo and a uh, Hue bulb for the price of an Amazon Echo," which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is like the Echo. I don't even remember what it is. Not the, the show, Pro but the whatever Pro it is. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the one with and- Zigbee probably. Uh, actually, no, it's the one, it's the normal Echo Tower one, the cylinder one. Oh, okay. I have yeah, like yeah. two of them. I don't remember. Yeah, those, yeah but those have the Zigbee radios in them as well. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I pretty, not, I'm that. pretty sure. I thought it was just the pros that had it, but, mm. but regardless, I yeah. mean, but, but that, that's the only time I see deals on stuff like this, right? On, on Hue and so, and, and this is actually one of the big reasons why I opted to not go to Hue or to smart bulbs at all. Um, uh, for me, the smart switch gave me a lot more control uh and and I, in my head i don't know why this makes no sense at, at all but in my head i'd rather spend 60 dollars on a switch than a 60 dollars on a light bulb yep. right? absolutely it, it's oh, absolutely it, it, it's just it's just you know it's i know i know a switch normally costs like two bucks or three bucks or whatever and a pack of like three light bulbs yep. costs like five bucks but when you can uh, spend that one sixty dollars to control multiple lights like right yeah yeah Right, exactly. Right, so in my head, that that's how I'm doing the math, at least, or that's how I'm <laughs> rationalizing it. But 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 Keith, I I completely agree with you, right? And 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 that's a great reason. At least LifeX goes on sale, or or even if not LifeX, whatever other offshoot of a Zigbee light mm. bulb or or even a Wi-Fi light bulb, whatever, those go on sale. Philips Hughes don't, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and or maybe they do, but not very know, it's often. Not gonna be a great sale. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It'll, it'll be very rare, and when it is rare, it's uh, not great, right? right? It's not. It's not like wow, I can get this for fifty five bucks instead of sixty, right? You're so, not going to get it cool. cheaper than like a, a an IKEA light bulb, or no, something like no, that. right, right. And they're 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 Philips's uh, uh, Cree integration is it, like it just didn't. I mean, I am probably twenty feet from my front porch. I'm sitting next to, in my back office with my Phillips hub on the top of my, mm-hmm. my hutch and mm-hmm. 20 feet away granted through not, not cement block wall, but drywall. Um, it, it just, it never worked. I mean, it should, I mean, not, not that it never worked. It was just not very reliable. Sure. I, I just switched. I, I just went Wi-Fi and, and I've got a, um, one of the, the ubiquity, dream machines last year that the mm-hmm. man I just love but and again for the accessibility um, the the ubiquity line of products is a, a prosumer type product that yep. that you can um, manage and manipulate very easily through their their iOS app which is fully accessible I have not run into one area that has not been and it's because they probably just use the the apple switch um, buttons and you know they're they're all their internal stuff rather than their mm-hmm. own um uh, sp- special made products or or, or interfaces but right. you know so that having that and my my wi-fi is just just been gr- granted it's not wi-fi six but it was a choice i made 
I don't need it. I, sure. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not that impatient. <laughs> for, 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 for the for the one device you may have in the next couple of years that'll support Wi-Fi six. Exactly. Exactly. It's too <laughs> right. early. Too early. But anyway. So. Um, so yeah, that's I, I switch. And you mentioned switches. I. Um, well, let me circle back around to the whole Zigbee Z Wave thing. Um, yeah. I settled on Z Wave, and being a Mac user, I don't use any. Um, Docker or um, Has iOS or Has IO uh, systems, yeah, yeah. any of that stuff that's come along, I yep. directly install from pip. I I, I just okay. grab it, pip three install home assistant and dash dash update and boom, I'm I'm updated. And and um, one of the things that when I started getting into the uh, Z Wave side of it was that the um, Z Wave integration was spotty. Um, mm. You had to use Open Z Wave. And yep. um, yeah, I don't know if, if you ever have the time or inclination, go back and look, do a search on, on Z wave in, in the community forums. I bashed the hell out of that thing and, and, and finally came up with a way to, to get a method for getting it compiled and running on my Mac. And man, that was, that was great. I, um, that would have been a mission. Oh my goodness! It it was yeah. It's uh, yeah. when they integrated uh, Z Wave into um, uh, into the home assistant, the uh, the H A Z Wave or whatever yep. whatever yep. it yep. is. Um, that that they, it built it and it was always perfect. And it was great. Um, I haven't had a day one problem with it since, but uh, uh, I, I I'm nervous about going through the new like H A Zigbee or H. Right, mm, the, the Z Wave to MQTT. Yeah, Z, that's it. Z Wave to MQTT. Yeah. That, um, so I bought a bunch of in wall switches that were Z Wave. The uh, yeah. Jasco uh, branded, but they're branded uh, GE and uh, Honeywell. And okay. um, mm-hmm. I think it's just the three GE, Honeywell, and Jasco, but they're all built by Jasco. Same switch. It's a, the, you know, the rectangular rocker. Light switches. That's what we have in mm-hmm. our house. And my wife yeah. didn't want any of these new, funky looking switches in her house. She want you know. I had to. I had to maintain the look, and so I landed on those, and they've been great. I've got. Uh, I've got one in my kitchen, one in the dining room, and the other one um, is the actual. Uh, not the front porch light, but the. Uh, the outside light, but the front porch light. When I have like a, a I don't call it a mud room kind of thing, but it's a screen enclosure. Mm-hmm. When you walk in, it's a little alcove. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so in there, the, the yeah, this was bef- you can't buy any um, automation products that are the the little candelabra type lights. You, you, yeah. you, those are just too small for the Wi Fi right now, anyway. Um, yeah, you're talking. You're talking just just for reference's sake. If anybody doesn't know, it's those. It's a smaller type of light bulb that are super thin, typically skinny, and yeah. What are they? A twenty, uh, like an A fourteen. A four is it like an A fourteen? Sort of yeah, something like that. <sighs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah it's, I think Philips Hue have an A fourteen. It's yeah, it's a really small, much smaller than a regular A nineteen um, um, socket, yeah, mm-hmm. and and the, the base is smaller as well. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So having having her pretty light out there that supported those, I had to look for a different situation and. And so I threw a, a, a Z Wave switch on there, and mm-hmm. um, and then Ring came out with this product after their their. I put a Ring doorbell on my front door um, with video, but that's for my wife and daughter. Um, the uh, um, they came out with their Ring security system that was oh my goodness Z Wave. I'm going to be able to put Z Wave a Z Wave security system into my home assistant. <laughs> Not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until recently, there's a, uh, a project called uh, uh, Ring MQTT. Yeah. That I took the time, made the time <laughs> to to get installed and up and running, and now I have I have my entire um, Ring security system in Home Assistant, and am able to um, create automations based on those those uh, uh, sensors. So okay, that made cool. that, I, that was like like oh you know <laughs> yeah so. so I guess this sort of is a, a good segue into sort of how are you using you know Home Assistant and, and all the automations you know to make 
your life better. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing for you, you know, you know, you can't use video cameras, and, but you you can use the sensors that they can provide. You know, motion sensors and all that. So, how does you know a home assistant you know help you around the house? So, like I mentioned earlier, I do have light perception, and like a sailor at night, I use light as navigational beacons. I have lights set up around my house that are um, specifically, well, not necessarily specifically, but I use them specifically for uh, orientation. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I've lived in this house for 10 years, so I could probably (laughs) walk it blind, but it it just helps (laughs) to... um, not walk into that table because you think you're where you are and you're not by having a a light available to you there. So like when I, um, when I walk out of my office, if there is no light on in the living room, my living room's at the end of the hallway. If the, if the, the library table lights not on, then my motion sensor says that, that I'm, I've left the room. It, It turns off pretty quickly. And what goes on and then turns off pretty quickly because it's, it's like a beam across my door. Um, and it will, it will say, okay, if the light's not on, irregardless of the time of day, if the light's not on, turn, right. it, turn it on and, and leave it on because, you know, at that point I'll either turn it off myself or whatever. So that, um, what really got me, uh, after the Christmas thing, what really got me interested in automations were, was the fact that, for the first time we had a garage and my wife, you know, every night you have to go out and, t- and check the garage. And, and well, for me, that meant I have to go out to the garage door and verify that it was closed. So, you know, I actually physically go out and touch it. If, mm, and yeah. So yeah. if my wife didn't do it, you know, and, and to, when I rely on my wife, it's like she, she'll fall asleep on the couch and forget. And, you know, there, there were, were many nights that, that the garage door got left open, which is, you know, no, <laughs> not, sure. not in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I, I started looking for a solution to, um, to, to, for a sensor for my garage door. Well, um, at the time, Chamberlain and the what is it, MyQ or my my yeah, something yeah. like that. They weren't around. Yep, my Q. Yeah, they weren't around at that time. So I baked a, a at the time Belkin came out with their Belkin Wemo Maker. I don't know if you remember those or not. Yep. Yeah, the little devices that you could basically you know plug your own sensor into. Yep. It was. Or, well, it, was like, it was like a relay. Yeah. Yeah. It had a, it had a sensor and a relay block on it. And, yeah. and so I grabbed a, um, a stack of rare earth magnets and set, set them on the garage door, got a magnetic relay, a uh, magnetic read switch, hooked it up to the sensor side and hooked the switch side, at, which, and that was really nice about the maker as well, is that you could set it into momentary mode as well. So, yeah. so I set it momentary and hooked it up next to the garage door where the, the, interior garage door switch was and uh, it's still running to this day so i get i get to uh, you know have access to whether or not the switch is opened or closed and if it's you know i i said i set an automation starting at seven o'clock on the hour every hour to check whether the door is open until midnight and if it's open close it right so um Makes sense. That, yeah, that made well. It it's bit us a couple times, not very often. Um, in that we'll be out there in the summertime doing something in the garage mm. or something, <laughs> and all of a sudden I'll hear a screech out of my daughter because the garage door started closing and scared the hell out of her. But <laughs> oh man! <laughs> or you go yeah. out at five minutes to you know put the bins outside and then come back down on the drive and it's closing because you've taken too long. Exactly. To the bins out or something. Exactly. So. Um, there is that. So that's, um, that's one of my automations. Um, I have, uh, a favorite automation of mine that, that, so being blind, I rely on to get to work. Well, before this COVID thing, um, I relied on getting right. to work with a paratransit service here in Tampa and they, what they do is they have these paratransit buses that will come to your, your driveway, pull up in front of your driveway and start their backup beepers that me, me, you know, and, yep, and yep. To, to notify you too lazy to get out and come up to the door and ring the doorbell. Right. <laughs> they'll just, 
and <laughs> my pickup time is six o'clock in the morning and I have neighbors, <laughs> you know, oh, no. I got yeah, old that's, neighbors. <laughs> that's, so, yeah. so it, it, I looked for a long time. Matter of fact, when, when Carlos posted his, um, and I still have some that I use with the ES, uh, ESP, um, 8266 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah. is the motion, uh, motion detector he built with the Legos. Mm-hmm. Um, I grabbed that idea and I actually put, I, I, I was looking for a way to put one of those into uh, like a, a waterproof electrical box that I could hook up to my, my mailbox with a battery, you know, one of these coin cell, you know, uh, uh, yep. like a phone charger batteries kind of thing yeah. and, and put, put that in there. Um, it doesn't work too well. It lasts about 20 minutes because Wi-Fi just sucks it down. So, right, right. <laughs> didn't even think about that. You know, I got all excited. Yeah, I got this box built. I got my, I mean, dude, I went all out with the epoxy and made this thing yeah. waterproof and everything and got it out there. And 20 minutes later, why am I not? Oh my it's gosh. Yeah. 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 Really sucked. Well, Zeus came out with a, uh, a waterproof motion sensor that, um, it runs off of three AA batteries. And okay. so I, it took a bit for Open Z Wave to to bring it into the fold after they released it at, at Christmas time, I think a year mm-hmm. ago, a year and a half ago now. Um, mm-hmm. But I was patient and we got finally got it integrated into the system. And now what happens is between six and six forty five, it will send me notifications to if there's traffic on my street, basically. It's, it's, it's yeah. kind of, it, it's a beam across my driveway. It's going across my, cause I set it on the side of the mailbox and, yep. and, yep. but it, the, the span of this, the uh, PIR sensor is such that, that it'll catch a, a vehicle going down the street. So when, a, when, a, when a car comes up and not necessarily parks when it goes by, um, yeah. it'll kick off. Well, I live on, it's, it's not a very busy street at all. So I may get during the day, probably maybe six cars, you know, garbage trucks, mailman, few people okay, driving yeah. through the street. Cause I'm on the end of a peninsula down here. So it's not the environment is supports me being able to do that. So when, when, when they come it, it, it between the, the hours of six to six forty five, it'll set off. And previously it was just sending me a notification on my phone. Um, I then use, um, the Alexa integration to, yep. to play TTS back to my echo in the living room says that your transportation has arrived. Cool. So, um, so it allows me to do that. And then, <laughs> then once, um, once I do that, it, it then kicks off the front porch outside light as a flasher. It, it, it flashes it 10 times to signal okay. the driver not to turn on their damn backup beeper that I'm aware that they're there. <laughs> and so, man, that has worked out so well. It, it's just, that's <laughs> my favorite integration right now. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure your neighbors thank you for that one. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got a 87 year old neighbor that lives next yeah. to me who is, yeah. is much appreciative. Let's just say that. Cause he's called, he's called on him. He's like, you know, can you ask them? So I, you know, for a long time it was, can you just do it like twice? I hear you, especially during the, the cool months when I've got the front door open, you know? Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah. Uh, that's, well, that's a good way to, that's a good way to useful automation. Yeah. Right. And, and, and especially from an accessibility perspective for you as well, right. Using things like TTS, mm-hmm. I think uh, is a great, or text speech is, is a great uh, method. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a, just a different way of no- notification. You know, I, the, yeah. the phone is great. You get, you get the little tone sounds, but you know, um, yeah. you tend to ignore those after a bit because they're just so much. Although I, I think I've seen with the new version that you can actually, set different uh, notification sounds for um, uh, f- for the home assistant app on there which yeah, I haven't played yeah. with but but I'd like to because I, I need to know or would like to know if it's a, a HA um, notification or if it's just a text coming in or whatever you know mm-hmm. but uh, um, but yeah I know um, I've got uh, I got some motions so I, uh, I repurposed those uh, um, ESP uh, 8266s that I made into motion detectors to the back porch 
um, that, that they look like a, a, a wall switch because I put them in, uh, just put it in a, not a wall switch, a, a outside plug switch, you know, waterproof. Um, mm -hmm. So people, people won't, you know, if an intruder comes, they won't be aware that it's a, uh, uh, an actual motion sensor in there. Um, uh, I want to get more into the, um, the, the, <laughs> I forgot to mention it at the beginning. My wife has a saying for me. She says she's, she's the only blind guy in, in the world that has an infatuation with lighting. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I want to, I, I want to put some, some, uh, I, I have motion sensing lights around the perimeter of the house for security purposes, yep. but I'd like to make them smart in that I'd like to have some notification when, let's say the, the one in the back corner of my house that, that should never go off goes off, you know, mm -hmm. because either, either it's, it's a larger animal or it's somebody coming into my backyard, that kind of thing. Right. You know, um, but yeah, no, so that's, um, I, I, I don't have any, any water sensing, um, or, or, um, power sensing devices. Although, um, I just listened to your last episode with the gentleman from Montana using that one, yep. one PM. Yep. I, I, I want to get one of those. Um, that, that piqued my interest in that, uh, um, I can not necessarily use it for energy monitoring, but I can use it for, uh, charging the, you know, making sure and knowing that my power tools, you know, well, Again, back to my daughter's house. I'm, we, I have a, 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 a sawzall and and a hacksaw that that I need mm -hmm. to know when they're charged. And it's like either you just throw them on there and hope that they're charging, and and wait an hour, half an hour, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if I could if I could throw them on to one of those and say, okay, well the draw is done, it's charged, um, and get a notification, that'd be great. You know, yeah. simple, simple things like that, that, that yeah, yeah. Would make life, your life a lot easier for, for knowledge of something happening is, is kind of what I'm into. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's fair. So you, you, you mentioned you use Amazon echoes, things like that. Um, is that your primary method of doing anything home automation wise? Cause especially, I mean, for me without having accessibility requirements, I, I hate pulling out my phone for whatever, or pulling out the laptop to make a change, uh, is that obviously, well, A, how has that changed the game for you or has it? And, uh, and B, um, do you utilize it? I do. I guess B first. Um, <laughs> B first. Yes, I do <laughs> utilize it. Um, I use, I use, uh, um, the, the echoes to, um, I have a dot in my office here. Yeah. I have a second generation echo. In, which is getting long in the tooth. I need to replace it because she yeah. she's like me, becoming hard of hearing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think they do that on purpose. I seriously do. They they, they yeah. degradate the, the the microphone in order to, to um, make you go out and buy a new product. But yeah, no, we, we I do use that. But what I do with those and as well as Siri um, or HomeKit is yeah. that. Um, I use, I try to use native integration where I can. So, and I started because the echo would, when you go into the app and you scan your house, it would, and this is again before, um, Nabucasa. Yeah. Um, it, it was before that. So, um, I would, I, I used the Alexa integration and then I would go in and scan the system and mm -hmm. I would get double entries everywhere. And again, when you're when you're navigating something serially, it, it, it's a pain in the ass. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I had that exact problem, and I hate I it. I hate it. So what I do what I do now is I only allow Home Assistant to propagate devices that are not native to the the native stuff. Yeah. Uh, to, to, so for, as an example, if you've got Philips Hue, you would have the Philips Hue integration added to the Amazon Echo account. And then you would exclude those entities that may be connected to Home Assistant from being pushed over to the, the Amazon, Amazon Echo. Echo. That's yeah. correct. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what I do. Um, and the same thing with uh, the HomeKit. Um, I was using HomeBridge previously, and then then um, then HomeKit became 
integral to, to you know integrated into Home Assistant. So I use mm-hmm. that now, and and I only I you know I, I put the like my life X bulbs are all in HomeKit natively scanned yeah. images, and then um, uh, I have the uh, the the my bedroom light here, which is a BR thirty life X that for some reason I just cannot get HomeKit to recognize. Um, all my Z, my Z wave switches and stuff all get get uh, propagated into HomeKit through Home Assistant that way. Um, so so I don't get doubles, double hits, and so on. Right. So um, same. Although the I have a, a third generation Echobee, and mm-hmm. I'm I haven't got my head quite wrapped around it yet, but I I want to. I've got it hooked directly to HomeKit, but it's not local. I don't have local control over that entity, which is what I want. Even in HomeKit? Isn't HomeKit like required? No, HomeKit. So it's, well, let me rephrase. I don't have local control through Home Assistant right? for the Echo B. It's in HomeKit and I can set up my, my um, uh, automations Mm-hmm. via the HomeKit app if I wanted, but not through the Home Assistant app. I have to rely on the um, the Echobee integration to HomeKit to do any automation, or uh, through Home Assistant to do any automation on the Echobee, which if the Echobee goes down because it's using their API, I mean, if, if they go down, yeah. I, don't have, I don't have that local integration. I'm back to using my phone to, to operate yeah. my, my echo B, which sucks. I want, I want local control of my echo B through home kit. I mean, through home assistant. So, right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not a home kit user, but maybe you are, you probably more qualified to answer this than me, but I think home in home assistant, there is a two way, there's two types of home kit integration. So one is, you know, that you can expose your entities to Siri through Home Assistant. So mm-hmm. Siri can control the entities in Home Assistant. And the other way is that Home Assistant can integrate with HomeKit, HomeKit. devices on your network Correct. and then control them through HomeKit. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's either it acts as a controller or it talks to a controller. Yeah. One of the two. So I'm wondering if you could do it the other way and get Home Assistant to connect to your HomeKit devices and then control it locally that way. Where where HomeKit is the controller, sorry, where Home Assistant is the controller. Yeah, is there, yeah. yeah, well, can you run them both in tandem? Because like I said, I, I'm using I'm using HomeKit or Home Assistant to mm. propagate some devices to HomeKit. Yeah, um, I think, I thought you could. You I you thought can? you could, but I again, the, I haven't, I, I, I don't use HomeKit it, stuff yeah. personally, but. Sorry, Kate, go ahead. No, no, I just I started looking into it. and I do know what you're talking about. The the um, and, and but I haven't grokked that whole system yet. Um, in the, yeah, y- y- if I recall correctly, you have to take in order to get it working. You have to take the device and and again, my hesitation is because of the the visual thing. Um, you have to take the Echo B off HomeKit, remove it from HomeKit. Right, and then you have to, if I'm remembering, if I'm thinking correctly, you you have to bridge it to Home Assistant, and then use that to scan, or it it, it will send the the HomeKit request to the Echo B or through the Echo B, and and you have to scan it at that point. I don't know. I, it, it's it's it was a little Something confusing. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's that's a. That's a bucket list item. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that, and 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 I think I, I swear Echobee had something with local control. I I thought Echobee natively had it. Maybe they removed it. I could be wrong. No, the only but, local control of it is is the uh, not through the app. You can't control it through the app. It's it's through the touch screen on the the device. So interesting. Which okay. which <laughs> leaves me out of the loop. I got no control yeah, over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. So I got it. I gotta. I, I need to make friends with. If, if there's any Echo B developers listening, hit me up. I'm in Toronto. I know you guys are from there. <laughs> I need to make friends <laughs> with some Echo because because I, I I do I I honestly do love the Echo B platform. Yeah. Uh, when I and especially when I was choosing and and I'm not getting paid to say this, I, but you should pay me. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, 
you know, just again, they were pretty far ahead as well, right? With their sensors and all that, with the remote sensors and stuff. Nest came out with that recently. Echobee's kind of had that for a long time, right? Just again, that kind of stuff. I, I did really love that platform. So I, I have a ton of questions about how I can use it better and how I can save more money with it. So hit me up if you're, yeah, I like <laughs> if you're here. Oh, well, I like Echobee for two reasons. Um, the first is that uh, um, when when Nest came out, they I, I got all excited about that. And and so I, yeah. I started talking and, and sending emails to the developers because their app um, I downloaded and, and played with and it was totally inaccessible. I mean, it was it just it it was horrible, horrible, horrible. For Nest? Yeah, for the Nest product. Yeah, man, I, I find it inaccessible and I'm not visually impaired. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I stuck with, um, um, the, the, the old, just a, a regular digital thermostat where you had the button on the side yeah. and, and I never knew. I just, I, I just mashed the button three or four times and it would go on. And, and if it got cold, I'd go mash it down with three or four times and it goes off, <laughs> you know, one of those numbers. And, Perfect. and which pissed my wife off a lot because, um, sure. why is the AC set to 72? Well, yeah, yeah. because that was the number of times I mashed the button and that's what it got set to, you know? <laughs> so, um, it, it, she happened to be at a Home Depot and it was right after the Echo B4 came out. Okay. And she, my wife is, is a, a big time clearance shopper. So Love it. she walks into, she walks into Home Depot and she starts looking on the clearance rack and there in the back of the rack was a box that said Echo B on it, thermostat. And my wife's like, she'd heard me talking about Echo B. So she calls me up and she says, hey, there's this Echo B 3 thing here on the clearance rack for $65. I said, buy it. Buy it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I got my Echo B thermostat for $65. Bucks. Who, who, who could beat that, you know? Yeah, no, agreed. That's so, awesome. So we put that in and, and I've got... Um, one a lot another automation that I've done is that now especially now that I've got well, I, I went with the a I can't pronounce it a eotech aotech um, aotech aotech yeah, yeah. their their Z, Z wave um, uh, uh, Gen five radio and then yep. some of their I think it was the Gen five sensors. And they're beautiful. The multi sensors, the, the, the door window sensors. Multi yeah, six? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Their door window sensors are, are industrially designed beautifully. They're, I mean, oh, comparable I to uh, like Apple products. You yeah, know, the new stuff that Aerotech's come out with is fantastic. Is it really? They are oh. beautiful. Yeah. I, it's, you know, you know what? It's funny because I, I, I never ended up buying anything Aerotech, but they were one of the companies that inspired me to get into home automation the way I did, <laughs> yeah. um, which is unfortunate. I really, really think the products are beautiful. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I put I put one of those each on the front door and the porch door, the back door. And um, this was before the ring security system so that I could then have automations that, that said, you know, because here in Florida during the, um, the what, what you would call the fall and spring months, we have weather that you open the house in the morning because it's really cool, but by noon it's it, it's up to eighty degrees. So yeah, you know, but you it, the humidity's down and, and it's still comfortable. So the house is still open. Well, Echobi didn't know that, you know. So right. so I I then and this is one of the I circle back to to the the whole uh, ab demon thing. One of my more complicated. Once was that the you know if the, the if any of these sensors are um, not tri- or open yeah if, if they're open, open yeah. then mm. then don't set off the echo you know that that kind of thing um, well I now have a Aotech sensor on my front and back door and a ring sensor on my front and back door because I couldn't integrate the ring into it so so and i'm, I'm not about I'm, i might repurpose the the aotech somewhere else if, if mm-hmm. and do something else with them eventually but um they uh um uh, now that i have the ring integrated in i can i can use all my window sensors to add to that automation as well now because you know, a lot of times the doors are closed uh, and just the windows are open so and i didn't have any aotech sensors anywhere else other than on the doors because i didn't want to invest 
I knew that the ring product was coming out and it was Z wave and, and, and I didn't want to invest in those sensors and then double, I have to double up on the, the ring yeah. sensors. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And ring won't allow you to pull, well, wouldn't allow you to pull third party sensors into the mix as well. Um, they will now, but unfortunately the, uh, the caveat to that is that, oh yeah, you can bring third party sensors in, but guess what? If you have a monitoring system with us, we won't monitor that. Right. That's unfortunate. It is. It, it really is. I'm like, really? You're, it's so, sounds like lost business to me. It, it's stupid. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So so I and and I heard a buddy of mine told me that the uh, the second generation ring, the first generation ring sensors, door window sensors were big. These big ugly behemoths. I mean, they're just nasty looking. They're they're about the size of a Snickers bar almost. Yeah, you know. And, uh, and they said that, uh, their buddy of mine was telling me that the second generation are much smaller now and they look better. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll. That's cool. Start buying those. But, uh, but yeah, those are some of my few, you know, um, use cases. How, how I, uh, I can't think of anything else really. Um, uh, I do, I am planning on putting a, uh, um, Unbeknownst to my daughter, you can go back again to my daughter's house because that's at the forefront of my mind. Um, I'm going to put a remote HA uh, instance down there with a, a new, newer Raspberry Pi that I'll buy and, and slap mm-hmm. down oh, yeah. for um, and, and monitor her ring system as well. But, you know, I, it was only child, only daughter, and she's 24 and moving out. So daddy's a little concerned of course, of course he is. yeah 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 <laughs> but uh unfortunately can't have the you know can't hook up to the ring video but but i might just go ahead and hook up to the ring video and 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 have it available to my wife so that that we can see you know if anything has happened or or is happening that, that we know what's going on so yeah that makes sense and she's she she knows i mean she, she's been uh um my my eyes for years um and is uh um, very cognizant of my my hat my uh, hobby <laughs> so yeah so yeah, she's yeah. like oh man if i must you know but the the only like i said the only hue bulb is in her bedroom right now so she's she's wanting to get uh um some of those down down there as well so we'll, we'll start putting the hues in her house and it's a smaller house the the distance isn't uh um, anywhere near as, yeah. as long as I live in a long ranch style house where the house that she bought is, is a sm- much smaller, um, yeah, yeah. uh, uh, fifties style squat configuration. It's not very n- distance isn't a problem there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. That's my story. I mean, I, like I said, I just wanted to, to touch base with you, you know, and, and or the community really through a, a another me medium and, and yeah. request that, that, uh, accessibility become not become, but is think about it. In other words, don't, yeah. don't hmm. it, it's easier, to, like it's easier to bake something in rather than to go behind and fix it. Yes. Um, so, so if, if I can make people aware of that and, and that there are those needs and out there for us that, um, that, you know, it's just a, a better platform for us as well. You know, and I'm sure that, that there are other, I mean, you know, I'm blind. I, I have full capability of, of walking and talking and, and, and using my hands, but there are, are other accessibility issues out there. People that use different types of, of things that, that, may yep. find the the mm. you know a cli environment or or a, some type of a, a maneuverable switch or whatever is is easier for their input and so you know as, as as long as these things are taken into account at the beginning then then it's very helpful to us and we don't have to go behind and request and beg and and, and <laughs> you know that kind of thing so yeah you know. And I also think it, it, it highlights that, you know, from a, an accessibility point of view, where we're generally thinking of people in the home and how they interact with Home Assistant, as opposed to people that with, you know, different input devices and accessibility issues yeah. want to actually program on Home Assistant or use Home Assistant in their own homes and customize it for themselves. 
we, we generally sort of think, you know, okay, how is a blind person going to be able to interact with a, a tablet on a wall? Or how is, you know, someone, uh, how would we be able to create automations for people that, you know, may be deaf or something in the home? But we don't normally think of, you know, the other side, okay, how are they going to be able to program on home assistant? How are they going to, how is a blind person going to be able to drag and drop automations in our new automation editor mm-hmm. sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely, definitely stuff to think about, right? As, as I know, I know a lot of developers do listen to, to our mm. podcast. So as, as you're building these, you know, it, it is, it's to your point, Keith, it, it is something to keep in the back of your mind. It's easier to build it in than to retrofit it, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so, and anything they can do would be much appreciated. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think uh, I think that's a good place to uh, wrap. So, Keith, thank you so much for for coming on, and for all the listeners. If there's any uh, unique use cases out here, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, feedback at haspodcast.io. Yeah. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you. I appreciate Cheers. the opportunity, Daniel. Thank you. All right. If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.